And would you get out your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians and the second chapter. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. I want to talk with you and talk with you. I want to talk with you about love this morning. I want to talk with you about love this morning. Uh, you know, there have been just so many uh, that the, the topic of love has been the, the topic of so many books, uh, so many movies, thousands of books, thousands of movies, tens of thousands of songs. Uh, the topic of love has been in, in all of those, you know. And, uh, you know, you'd think after all that's been written about love, everybody would be experts. Wouldn't you, Gwen, wouldn't you think as much has been written and sung and, and acted about love, everybody would, be, everybody would be experts, you know? But the interesting thing, however, is that the majority of the people who have written about love have written about love from their opinion instead of writing about love itself. How many of you all remember uh, Tina Turner? Anybody remember Tina Turner? You know, Tina Turner wrote this. She sang this about love. What's love got to do with it? What's love but a second-hand emotion? Who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? Now, it's certainly a catchy tune, but I have to tell you, Miss Tina Turner couldn't be more wrong. Because love is not a feeling. Now, love produces feelings. How many of you all appreciate those feelings, huh? Love produces feelings, but love is not a feeling. Love is not an action. However, love elicits a response. The greater the love, the deeper the emotions. The greater the love, the more profound the action. The greater the love, listen, the more focused the life becomes. The greater the love. The Apostle Paul writes of the greatest love of all in Ephesians chapter 2. I want you to turn there. I want you to look with me. Book of Ephesians chapter 2. I want to begin reading right there at verse 4. Four. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4. I encourage you to read the whole chapter. It's wonderful, but I'm taking a segment out of it this morning. But God, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4, but God who is rich in mercy because of his what? Great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come, we're living in some of those ages to come. Can I get an amen this morning? In the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, say that with me, by grace... You have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast, for we are his, God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, I said that love is not an emotion, but Love elicits emotion. The emotional response of God's great love for us is his mercy. Did you hear what Pastor just said? God's emotional response. How many of you all realize God is an emotional God? God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, God the Son, emotional. Not in the way that humans can become emotional True emotion, deep emotion, great love. The emotional response of God's great love for us is His mercy. Verse 4, but God. You all know those are two of my favorite words in the Bible. Because when you have but God, something powerful is about to happen. 
God's intervention, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his what? Say it with me. Great love with which he loved who? Loved us. You know, a mother carries her baby for nine months. Unless your sister Fran, when Jonathan was born, and she went 10. A mother carries her baby for nine months as the baby forms and grows inside of her. You know, before the baby is even born, there begins to form an emotional bond between mother and child. Before they, before they see each other, before the baby is born, there's that emotional bond that begins to develop. And when that baby is born and laid on the chest of mama, that emotional bond is solidified. It now becomes solid. Who do you think loves deeper in that situation? Do you think the love of the mother for the baby is deeper? Or do you think the love of the baby for the mother is deeper at that point? Think about that. See, as a baby grows into their teenage years and then into the adulthood, the relationship can be broken. But the love of the mother for the child still remains. Is pastor speaking the truth this morning? Amen. Relationships can be broken, but the love of the mother for the child, that still remains. See, we were formed, you and I, we were formed in the mind of God. I want you to think about this morning. You and I, we were formed in the mind of God. Of God, before God created anything, before He created anything, before He spoke anything in existence, before God said, Let there be light, the entire plan of creation was already formulated and completed in His mind. You included in that plan. All of it. He had already thought through it. He had already figured it out. He had already worked it out. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit had already talked about it, already discussed it, already planned it out. When you were born, the bond of love between you and God was solidified. So let me ask you, who do you think had the greater love? God to you or you to God? As a baby, we can feel, we can sense, but we don't understand. God understood. God knew it all. God knew what it would cost him to love me. And that bond of love was solidified at my birth, at your birth. God loved you. He loves me. Our relationship with God was broken, severely broken. But our bond of love, that bond of love that God has for us, never was broken. Still remains strong. See, out of his love for us, God showed us what? Mercy. Because of his great love with which he loved us, he showed us mercy. God understood that we were lost in, in sin, but instead of condemning us because of his love, he reached out to us. He reached out to you and I in love, in his mercy. John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. For God so what? Almost everybody in the world knows that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, should not spend an eternity in punishment, but should have everlasting life. But listen to verse 17. Verse 17 says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. See, on God's part, there is no might. The might part is on our part. 
See, on God's side, his mercy is great. His mercy has the ability to reach out and to restore the bond of love and relationship with every single individual. It's those who decide that they are going to accept and receive that uh, reunited, re, uh, reconfigured, refreshed, renewed relationship. Those are the ones who are saved. So God's mercy in his emotional, God's mercy is his emotional response of love to each and every one of us. Love is not an action, but love elicits a response. You see, the action response of God's great love for us is His grace. His emotional response is His mercy. His action response to us is His grace. Look back at verses 4, 5, and 6. Because of His great love, God's great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up together and made us set together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You know, you, the object of God's love, were trapped with no hope of saving yourself. Boy, that's tough for us. You know, that human nature jumps in, that human pride jumps in. You know, I've been a good, I'm a good person. I've always been a good person. I, I treat other people good. I'm better than most and not as good as some, but better than most. And so, you know, I was a real prize catch. You know, God wanted me in his kingdom. So, you know, he didn't have to work too hard to get me in. You know, pastor's not saying that about himself because uh, I cost I cost God a lot to be accepted into his family, but we can think that. Reality is we had no hope. Absolutely. I, I don't want to dwell on this, but I want us to say, if you would, would you say, I had no hope. I had no hope without him. Therefore, God took action to rescue you with his grace. Through his grace, the Father sent Jesus to give us life. Look back at verses 4 and 5, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, dead, say that with me, dead in trespasses. See, it's not fun to say that, is it? Say it with me. Dead in trespasses made us alive. Say that, made us alive together with Christ. See, our relationship with God was totally broken. Many of you all remember the parable of the prodigal son. Jesus told that wonderful parable, that wonderful story. The prodigal son had grown tired of living under his father's authority. His life would be so much better. Everything would be so much more wonderful if he could just get out on his own and do his own thing because his father didn't understand him, didn't know what his needs were. His father was holding him back. And so he went to his father and said, Dad, give me what is due me. Give me what you owe me. Woo. So he demanded his inheritance and went off to do his own thing. You know, what we may not realize is that he had broken the covenant relationship with his father. He didn't just hurt his father's feelings, although he deeply hurt his father's feelings. That, that wasn't just it. He broke a covenant relationship with his father. A son did not receive his inheritance until the father had died. That's just the way it was. A son did not receive that inheritance that was going to be given to him until his father had passed away. Basically, the son was saying by what he did, Father, you are dead to me. My family is dead to me. Not only am I just going off to do my own thing and a little bit of rebellion, but he broke a covenant relationship by taking in his inheritance. He was declaring and he knew what he was doing. And the father understood what was happening. He said, Father, you're dead to me. My family is dead to me. The father never stopped loving the son. But the son had broken ties with the family. 
We see this in the expression of joy in the Father at the Son's return. It helps us to understand how seriously the covenant relationship was broken. In Luke chapter 15, verses 23 and 24, it declares, and the Father declares, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry, for this my son was what? Was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found because of the broken covenant the son had no right to anything to claim anything as a member of the family it's profound whenever we really come to understand that it's not just simply the father was upset you know sometimes parents get upset as you as a parent have you ever gotten upset at your children anybody ever got upset at their children Okay, I'll believe some of you never got upset with your children. I'll just accept that. I, highly suspicious, but I'll accept that. You never got upset at your children. How many of you all have ever said anything to your child that you really didn't mean? Anybody willing, brave enough to say, I said something to my child that I really didn't mean? And this wasn't what was happening to the father. The father wasn't saying, hey, look, I, I worked so hard to get this family business together. I've been working all my life. My father passed it down to me, and we've made it a success. Your brother's working hard. I'm working hard. Uh, this is a business I want to pass on to you. And now you're just snubbing your nose up at the family business. No, it was, it was more serious than that. The son was declaring that he had nothing. He wanted nothing to do with the family any longer. That covenant relationship was severed. It was broken. In Luke chapter 15, verse 21, the son understood the seriousness of this broken covenant relationship. He said, and the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. We need to understand once again, that's not just because he was humbled, because he realized what he had done. He broke the covenant relationship. He was out of the family. He thought his only hope was to come back to his father and beg his father to allow him to be a servant in the home where he had an inheritance because he no longer had an inheritance there. Come back and beg his father. Could he at least be a servant in his house? But the father chose. Do you hear what pastor is saying this morning? The father chose to take the son who was dead and restore him to life in the family once again. We need to realize that you and I were dead in our sins, dead in our trespasses. Pastor, why are you making that such an important point? We need to realize how dead we were so that we can rejoice in how alive Jesus Christ has made us. Can somebody say amen? Amen. It wasn't just I was doing a few things wrong in my life. It was I was dead to God. I had no relationship with him. I was destined to an eternity in hell, and there was no hope for me, no way back. It's not a good old boy thing. Well, if I'm just good enough, if the good things I do on this side of the scale outweigh the bad things, then I'm going to make it to heaven. And I'm a pretty good guy, so I'm going to make it to heaven. Satan lies to people all the time. No one in this earth will make Make it to heaven except for they receive Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Can somebody say amen to that today? I don't mean to be hard. I want to preach the truth this morning. See, the penalty of our sins had us destined for an eternity of punishment. But, the, but Jesus' death on the cross, listen, it built a bridge. When Jesus gave his life on the cross, it built a bridge. Jesus had never broken covenant relationship with the Father. Jesus' relationship with the Father was intact. He came down and he took the form that you and I have. He came down and became a man so he could represent you and I. And he could use his covenant relationship with the Father and extend it to us. And whenever he died, he paid the penalty for everything we've ever done wrong. The enemy will lie to us and tell us, oh, I've done so much wrong that God could never forgive me. No, Jesus' death on the cross is powerful enough to forgive every single sin that was ever committed and ever will be committed. But we have to return to the Father. We have to ask Jesus to apply the price 
of his forgiveness to our lives. We need to invite him to once again be the Lord of our life to establish that covenant relationship again when we walk across that bridge by asking Jesus to forgive us and become the Lord of our life. When we spiritually walk across, the Holy Spirit snatches us out of the camp of the enemy and places us as adopted sons and daughters in the family of God. And that is forever. That is for eternity. Can somebody say amen today? So we find that the action of God's love through grace gave us life. The action of God's love through his grace gave us life. Grace is powerful. Grace is powerful. Grace is the power of God in our lives. Grace enables us to be the sons and daughters of God that we could not be on our own. The Holy Spirit and God's grace and power in our life enables us to do what we could not do without it. You see, through his grace, the Father sent Jesus to give us restoration life. Verse 6 says, and raised us up together. Raised us up together. There's an old hymn we sang years ago. It said, he brought me out of the miry clay. He set my feet on the rock to stay. You know, the concept was the writer was trying to give an illustration of how we were mired down in our sin, mired down in our lives. You know, Linda, the amazing thing was is when I was living in sin, I thought life was pretty good. I was doing the things I wanted to do. I was enjoying life until I wasn't. You see, the enemy has this great way and sin in our lives to, to take us places where we never really wanted to go. And to keep us there longer than we ever wanted to be there. And to cost us more than we were ever willing to pay. Whenever I got to that place where it had cost me everything, I opened up my ears to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit calling me back to covenant relationship, restoration life through Jesus Christ. Can somebody say amen this morning? Amen. See, Jesus came to give us new life here and now. We need to be walking in new life. We need to be living in new life. There, there, is a, there is a legal aspect of this. There is a justification that takes place. That when we ask Jesus to forgive us of our sins, as far as the Father is concerned, it is just as though we have never sinned. He wipes all of it out. It's not held against us any longer. But how many of you all know there's more than a legal aspect of our relationship with God? There is a newness. There is a freshness. There is a life. That he wants to give us restored life, restoration life. Through his grace, God gives us the power to live differently. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 3 declares that we all once lived under the influence of the world and the control of the Satan, being led by our own sinful desires. James warns us and tells us that we are led away by our own desires, and whenever those desires are fully hatched in us, they turn into sin and cause death in our lives. But verse 4 Verse 4 in Ephesians chapter 2, those wonderful words, but God, but God. God intervened through his grace and gave us his Holy Spirit. And through the Holy Spirit living in us, we now have the power to live free. The power to live free. If time would allow me this morning, I would go into even greater depth. And the way the Holy Spirit gives us the power to live free, but let me just let me just give you this this morning. There are things in our lives that really the scripture says in Romans, sin no longer has any dominion, it has no authority over us. But there are things in our life that have not been healed yet. 
There are things in our life that were a part of our personality before we accepted Jesus Christ. There are hurts in our lives that others have inflicted on us, and it's caused wounds in our life, and it's caused responses to those hurts and those wounds that cause us to act up and act out and do things and make decisions that are contrary to God's will and purpose for our life. How many of you all know even when all that's going on, you're still a son or a daughter of God? You're still a child of God. But Jesus came to give us restoration, life, and the Holy Spirit living and dwelling inside of us. And whenever the Word of God links with the Holy Spirit of God in our lives, whenever we learn and read and understand the truth of how we can live free in Jesus Christ, and we don't just simply say, oh, I can't do that. That is not, God never really intended us to be that. But when we take the Word of God and say, God wouldn't have wrote it down if He wasn't going to empower me to live it. Amen? And we we rely on the Holy Spirit to begin to change and transfer those things in our lives, then that which used to keep us down no longer has any control over us. Those things that those adult figures, those authority figures said negatively against us, those actions that others did no longer have any authority over us. Why? Because through the power of the Holy Spirit, we're able to forgive them. And once we forgive them, we're released from the hold that they once had on our lives. And the power of God working in our lives heals that spot. So those things that used to be painful now are just a distant memory and a reminder of the glory of God, His grace, and His power to set us free. Through His grace, the Father sent Jesus to bring us into fellowship with Him now. Look at verse 6. And made us sit together on a church pew, a Christian life, assembly of God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. The ultimate, ultimate joy in our life is to be able to go to church on Sunday morning. Thanks to you for saying amen. <laughs> but we know there's a higher goal, isn't there? There's a higher joy. Look at it again. And made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Did you hear what Pastor Hensel said? Right now, sitting together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus is in us. And we are in him. You know, Renee... Sometimes that embarrasses me a little bit when I realize that Jesus is in me through the Holy Spirit because I may have thought something I ought not have thought or did something I ought not to have done, you know, especially when I'm driving down Highway 19. I'm getting better. I'm getting better. You keep praying for me. Pastor's getting better. And then I think, the Holy Spirit's living inside of me, Cindy. Jesus is in me. And he had to deal with that attitude? Oh, Lord, forgive me. Sorry. But on the other side, there's a power, right? Jesus lives in us. See, we're in him, and he is in us. We are in him. Not, not just him in us. Listen, it's powerful. Not just him in us, but we are in him. We are surrounded in him. Hey, Philip. Would you stand up for a moment, brother? Anybody not able to see Philip? You know, we're the same size. Wait a second. See, Philip and I, we're the same size. You know, if I was walking down a dark alley, Bob, would you stand up for me, please? If I was walking down a dark alley, the, the place I'd really like to be is right behind Philip and right in front of Bob. Right? Thank you, guys. Let's give him a big hand for standing up. But, but the thing is, is we are in Christ. And as wonderful as guys as Philip and Bob are and as, as muscular as they are, right, we've got Jesus. He trumps them. 
So whenever we're going through life, we need to understand Jesus goes before us, amen? He also is behind us. He's got our back. We are surrounded in Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, amen? If God is for us, who can stand against us? Come on. If God is for you, who can stand against you? Amen? Don't you want that covenant relationship with Jesus Christ to be fresh and renewed in your life every single day? Jesus is in heaven right now interceding on our behalf. Right now. We are, we are before the throne of our Heavenly Father right now because we are in Jesus and Jesus is in us and Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father right now. Listen, this isn't figurative. This is literal. This is truth. This is spiritual understanding. The Holy Spirit of God reveals that inside of us. It's spoken the truth in His Word. He is working in your life in a wonderful way. See, we have been lifted into the Father's presence through Jesus, and one day soon we will see him face to face. One day soon we'll see him face to face. And all the troubles and all the trials and all the challenges of this life will be nothing. What does Paul say? I count them as all rubbish for the glory and majesty of God. Changes our perspective on things when we realize the great love with which he loved us. I keep telling people I have a goal. I know that I look 25. It's okay, you can laugh. But you know, now that I've crossed that, you know, that 6-0... I've been telling people that my goal is to be as physically in condition when I'm 70 years old as I am now at 61. That, that's, that's just a goal, be as physically in good condition at 70 as I am at 61. And, and some days I'm confident I'm going to make that. And Pastor Ron, other days I am just wonder a little bit, you know. And, and, you know, if the Lord tarries, which I don't know that... I don't know that, that the trumpet's not going to sound before I hit 70. I, I have a feeling, folks, that, that I'm not going to get to see 70. I believe the trumpet's going to sound before that. But if the Lord tarries and I make it to 70 or 80 or 90 or even 125, eternity is still ahead of me. And I have to keep that right perspective that nothing in this life is big enough that God can't handle it, me and God can't handle it together, and nothing in this life I'm going to allow to sever my relationship. Not just the covenant relationship, that's the, that's the foundation, but the deep devoted relationship between me and my heavenly father me and my lord and savior jesus christ me and the holy spirit because the relationship that we have now is not going to end when my life in this life ends but it's going to carry me through all of eternity but it gives me the power to live free in this life you see the result of god's great love is a more focused life. The result of God's great love in our life is a more focused life. Look with me at verses 8, 9, and 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are His workmanship, Created in Christ Jesus, we have to be careful here because we tend to put our own translation of this verse in our lives. Why were we created? What is our purpose? Created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Every day when we get up, God's already got a plan and a purpose. 
Every morning when we open our eyes, whether you open them up at 4 o'clock in the morning or 2 o'clock in the afternoon, God's got a purpose. I want to encourage you, open them before 2 because you might have missed half of God's purpose by the time. <laughs> just say it. Just say it. God's got a purpose for us. See, God has given us the gift of his great love. He has freely given us the gift of his great love. Pastor Ron reminded us in the New Connections class this morning that God's love is an unconditional love. Unconditional love. Better than a mama's love. Mama's love can be pretty unconditional. But God, the Father's love, God, the Son's love, God, the Holy Spirit's love for us is unconditional. When we are at our worst, He is at His best. Come on. Amen. And He's given it to us as a gift. Your Heavenly Father created you and has given you a purpose. You know, so many times the enemy wants to lie to us. And I don't really have a purpose in life. And my purpose is over. I've reached a stage in my life where my purpose is over. How many of you all know God knew every stage of your life? Come on. And he has a purpose for you in every single stage of your life, no matter what it is. God has created us for a purpose. He's created you for a purpose. And he's working in your life, making you a masterpiece. I sent that out to some pastors this morning, and one of them sent me back. His wife's name, Pamela, and he says, I can't wait to tell Pamela that I'm a masterpiece. I want you to take a moment. I want you to look at your neighbor, and I want you to say, you're a masterpiece. God is making you a masterpiece. Now I want you to look at your neighbor and with just as much conviction and say, I'm God's masterpiece as well. Some of you need to hear that. Some of you need to hear yourself say that. Look at somebody. Don't, don't chicken out now. Look at somebody and say, I'm God's masterpiece as well. Come on. Come on. I'm God's masterpiece as well. Amen? God's doing a work in us. He's making us into his masterpiece. Don't fight him. Did you hear what pastor just said? Don't fight him. Walk with him. Don't, don't fight him. Walk with him. He's got this thing. He really does. He's got this thing. You know, God called me. I know he called me into the ministry when I was just a child. When I look back, when I remember the vision that he gave me, when I remember that time at the altar, didn't understand it all, but God was calling me into the ministry as a child. And I walked away from the Lord. I spent a lot of years of my life running from God. God finally in a small church down in South Florida at the altar, he called me back to him, rededicated my life to the Lord. I have to tell you that that night or that day and then that night being baptized, God radically changed John Hensel from that point on. Completely different. I didn't do it. The Holy Spirit did that in me. And God began that powerful work in my life to transform me and change me for his glory and for his honor. Amen? We need to understand we have to work with him. We have to allow him to do the work in us that needs to be done. The enemy will come and lie to us and tell us that this or that or we can't do this or God's not going to do that or God's not going to accomplish. Come on up, musicians. God's not going to be able to accomplish the things in my life. I'm never going to be different. This is never going to change. I want to tell you this morning that I've been serving the Lord so long now that I, I never have a problem. I never have a stray thought. I'm never tempted to do anything outside of God's will or have an attitude that's wrong in any way. And if I don't stop lying to you now, I'm going to be in a lot of trouble <laughs> in just a little while. See, I'm a whole lot better man than I used to be. But I'm not as good of a man as I'm going to be. Amen. 
So wherever you're at in this walk, understand that you don't have it figured out. I don't care who you are. I don't care how much you think you've self-made. You don't have this figured out. You need Jesus. Jesus.